All right, let's talk about this. We got it for a little bit a short old time. Come on, man. All right, we got uh, batteries can short out, and without warning, I was taking a battery cable off one. I mean, battery cable off one time. I was Dodge truck, and I got my hand in front of my face, and boom, battery blew up. They can blow up like a bomb. You know, you ain't ever a battery blow up, they will explode. That's why we're always wearing safety glasses when we're around batteries, right? I mean, you've been around it a lot of times. It's kind of like a, 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 a order of like Russian roulette with about 200 uh, bullets in the yeah, like, Click, 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 click. Hey, I got away with it. And then one time it goes boom, you know, you go out. You know, my buddy Donnie said one time one blew up on him and he still remembers those pieces of jagged plastic in slow motion going past his head. And all that. So watch out for that. Be careful. Don't ignore that. Wire and out protection. Anytime you're in a shop you're supposed to be wearing them. You can find graphic photos of injuries from exploded batteries. We're not going to do that. Now, car batteries are set of plates. Each cell of a lead storage battery consists of alternate plates of lead, which is a cathode, coated with lead dioxide, and the batteries fill with a sulfuric acid solution. The acids were the, the acid actually wants the uh, electrons to care, to move. You know what I mean? That's what they travel through. You know, that, that's the way that I see it anyway. And this is actually the way it is. You know, this would be like one cell, and I've stacked all them cells to get them to made us a battery. Now, obviously, that's a long, skinny battery, but that's the way the battery's put together. The battery's charged, all the electrons are trapped on the anode side of each cell and are constantly looking for a path to the other side. Now we've talked about that. Before you do any troubleshooting on any starter charging system or anything else for that matter, make sure you've got a good strong battery. If you ain't got a good strong battery, or, then you're going to have some issues. A guy was uh, driving that uh, little Hyundai Elantra that said it quit up north of Prattville. He was saying that he, he noticed that the check engine light come on and other warning lights came on and all that and then just quit and went beside the road. Well, the voltage of the battery went down below the threshold that all the end control, all the controllers would accept, and they started turning on lights because it was seeing a, a, de a decrease in voltage. You see what I mean? All right, so you can disable a fuel ignition system to spin the starter for 15 seconds while watching the battery voltage. It ought to remain above 9.6 volts, and you're matching that battery to that car. See, it not all, it not, it's not supposed to go below 9.6 volts. If you got a good, healthy starter and everything, you spin that thing for 15 seconds. If it don't go below 9.6, doesn't matter about anything else in my mind, it'll actually work for that particular part. All right, so let's got a little voltage drop thing here. I'm going to show you all this little piece of a video here, if I can get it to play. All right, now then, now here is your standard old everyday, standard old everyday test line. Now watch what's happening. Look at, see? See, it's bright, it's dimmer right there. All right, now the load that's being put on that battery there yeah, is the test light. Troubleshoot where somebody's already replaced the battery, uh, they've already cleaned the terminals, and the starter still turns slow, and they've already replaced the starter. And this takes a minute to go through. Now, if you do it the right way, you go to the most positive part of the circuit. Well, the ground is actually required to have less voltage drop than the Okay, so we're checking voltage drop right there between the terminal and the post on that. And so I got to go kind of around the back so you know not the way the meter is. All right, now, when there's not much of a load, you're only going to see a little bit of voltage drop. But to get to speed this up a little bit, whenever we try to start the car, it's not starting, or you turn on the key actually, any so that are more voltage trying to go through there, you notice between the post and the terminal is where we're going and what we're measuring and how much is being lost there. That's what voltage drop's all about. That's what I want everybody to totally understand right here. All right, now that's when we turn on the when we turn on the key there. See if I can get around the back where you can still see the meter. So there, well we got 10.3 in it battery, which is kind of weak for obvious reasons. But Five point seven volts is being dropped. See how when I went bright to the post and up, and it's thirty right there. All right. All right. So <coughs> I want to get done with that. Okay. Voltage drop test. It's spin the starter with the meter set up as shown. You're going to have a meter going from the hot side of the post. If you can get right on that that post and go to there to that uh, big post on the starter, then spin it over. You shouldn't have over a half a volt there. On the negative side, going to the body of the starter, you should not have over a tenth of a volt. Remember those test points. That's going to be a part of your final exam. You're going to do a voltage drop test like this as a part of your hands-on final. 
but there's you know several parts we had all final. All right, now this here, these starters here, you got brushes here, and what you're doing is you're creating a magnetic field that every time this moves, those brushes remain stationary, and that magnetic field basically causes these magnets to chase their, you know, because that magnetic field will chase its tail, and that's what spins that starter. And yeah, that's what that's what these permanent magnets here are. See that permanent magnets in that? Now that's in here that doesn't actually go with that, but you can see kind of how they go. All right. Uh, now then, this is whenever the starter is resting right here, not doing anything. You notice this copper washer right here? Now you got battery power coming here, and this one here is hooked into the starter. But when you look at a starter, I want you to see this from now on. Whenever you energize that, this throws that into the flywheel before this contact is ever made. So you want that, that gear to go into the flywheel first, and then you want this contact to be made by this washer and that starter goes to spinning. Uh, it's a theoretical impossibility. One time on a Taurus I had, I put a starter on it and everything was fine for about a month. And then one day, it was energizing the motor before this ever got into the flywheel, just without warning. I drove it every Sunday in the morning, and fine, when to get in the afternoon and go home, and it went, yeah! and it's trying to bite the teeth off the flywheel. And so I had to stop. And then I got a ride home, came back the next day, to put a different starter on it, got to replace the starter. Learn how the system is wired and how it works. Now these things, there's a whole bunch of different ways. You've seen these uh, later model GM cars where you just touch the key and it starts it without you having to do, you just touch it and it starts it up. That's basically a decision that's being made by the body controller or PCM or whatever, and the relay is built into the fuse panel. Uh, but you basically, this one here is going to be hot and start run. PCM watches neutral safety switch and passive any theft. And so basically, it's going to decide whether that starter relay is energized or not. All right, now this one here, you know, your manual lever position sensor, that's going to be your, your pringle stick, you know, for your one that turns on your backup lights and all that. Uh, if it's in, in park or neutral, it basically is going to enable power to go and pull that starter in. You know, just, you know, does the anti-theft system affect the starter? If you go to start one and you see the theft lights blinking real fast, that's going to be probably your reason, because it'll lock out the starter in a lot of early on it didn't. But now there's a fuse, is there a fuse involved? Uh, how is the vehicle equipped? How about aftermarket devices? You want to look and see if there's a fuse, if it's got a fuse in there and that fuse is blown, or maybe I have put a blown fuse in there, plant a bug or something like that. You need to be thinking about that. I like to go, if I can get to it, with a test light directly to that small terminal on the starter, have somebody turn it to start, see if that terminal lights up. If it does light up, then you want to go and you want to do a voltage drop test on the negative side. You know, that's really important. Because you can get in a mess, even if you got power on the positive side, but you've got voltage drop between the main battery terminal and the side of the block or whatever, you had issues with that. You might notice a lot of the times now the, uh, the doggone uh, ground is going to go right there and hook to the starter. You know, that's the place, the most you know, intense place. That right there is a little piece of a short video right there. If I can find it, if I can find my mouse, there it is. Yeah, it's yeah. a bench test of a bad starter. Use a strong battery to pair of jumper cables. You can bench test your starter. If you got any doubts about your starter being the problem, take it off the car, lay it on the bench, hook your jumper cables up to it. It ought not to go and just barely turn. Or it ought not to just click. It ought to spin like it wants to jump out of your hand. That's what it ought to do. You got a good strong battery to check it with. This right here with a freshly replaced starter we get, we worked on here one time. She said, I was having to tap my starter to get it to spin. And she says, I put a starter on there, and I'm still having to tap it to get it to spin. And it turned out that little scorch marks around that damn gum screw right there. That's where the brushes in the starter are getting their ground, is where those screws right there. And I used to see that on Power Stroke Diesel. They had big old expensive Mitsubishi starters on them. And you look at the back of it, if you see scorching around that screw, I'd take that screw out and brush it really good, put it back in there and tighten it up, I'd fix that truck with the, but it's cleaning that little screw on the starter. It's one tiny little place that kept that whole truck from going anywhere. Right? All right, so anyway. Now this right here is an overrunning clutch. Right here, I'm going to show you another little piece of video now. You might have heard it before. You see that overrunning clutch right there? How many of you guys that worked on bringing the strap lawnmower? You know where you pull that cord and it starts? Yeah. And then that little place where you pull the cord there, it's got little balls in there that roll around. You ever take one of them apart? That's an overrunning clutch set of sorts, similar to this. Now I'm going to show you. You may have heard this sound before. I don't know if I can get this volume up or not. Let's set this high a little bit right now. All right. 
Underground, right here. You ever heard that? But the next time it worked right. See that? What you had was that whining was because that overrunning clutch is bad and it started out. And if that overrunning clutch is bad, it'll go. Wah, 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 wah. Wah, wah, wah. It's aggravating as all get out if you're trying to start the thing go somewhere. You know what I mean? But you got to put a starter drive in it. Usually a starter now. Back in the day, we used to rebuild starters. We pull them apart, put brushes and bushings and all kinds of stuff in them. That's death. That's seventies stuff, man. You know, and before that. All right. The alternator is a, a robust component. It's got this is an alternator. Now it's got to have a wide range of temperatures and RPM ranges. It's just going to work its fanny off under there. And they take advantage of induction. That's a term describing the fact that when copper wind is sweep through a magnetic field, electrons start to flow. All right. This alternator is produces more than 100 amps most of the time, most of them today do. And uh, we have cast aluminum case, spinning magnetized core called a rotor that can reach speeds of 14,000 RPM. How do you know that? Well, that little bitty pulley is going to be spinning a lot faster than a big one is driving it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you're really getting on it, that alternator is going to be tacking up really, really, really big time. All right, now that little part in there that's hooked to this, this is the, the rotor assembly. And right back there is a bearing, you go to the back of the case, but just in front of that bearing is a couple of slip rings for brushes to ride on. This is the stator. And back in this, in the other side of the stator, the stator is either wound like a, in a triangular way with three different connection points, or it's wound like a Y with three different connection points. But you notice they wrap them wires all the way through that laminated core, and that laminated core is machined so that it's only about 40 thousandths of an inch from this. It never touches, but it's real close to it. And boy, can it ever crank out some juice. All right, so it spins the magnetic field through the stationary outer winding, which is called a stator. This part out here is a stator, and that's what you're going to see right over there. See that piece right on the board? That's a stator. And then other parts of the rotor. The rotor's hooked to the pulley, and this is an overrunning pulley. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, the brushes make contact right here on the little slip ring. You ought to be able to get your meter and measure from there to there and feel about four or five ohms. But that's the winding inside this spinning part. And that's where the alternating current is created. The alternating current is created in this stator that's on the outside, right? The magnetism is here, and it creates current as it sweeps past this core and those windings. And that's kind of the rotor spins inside the winding with that laminated core. And this is a sort of a simplified version of it. But if you spin that thing really fast and you've got that energized right there, uh, then basically you're going to have a bunch of use being actually. I sort of screwed up on that. This is, a, I mean, I can't believe I used that, that uh, uh, illustration. That's a permanent magnet motor. And actually, that's got a uh, north and a south. <laughs> I just did that this morning. I mean, but anyway, that's a north and a south, and whatever you put power and ground there, this constantly runs from it. That's not a, but anyway, you get the point. Boy, that was a real foul up. I just can't believe I did that. That's what happens whenever my wife is trying to call me. He's like, hey, come in here and get these clothes with laundries through and all. <laughs> and I'm just in a big hurry. <laughs> all right. The rotor is energized by way of the brushes. One brush is hardwired into the ground or power, and the other is switched off and on by a voltage regulator. Now, here's your brushes right here. See that? They ride against these slip rings. And those slip rings, uh, you may see a lot of wear on those. All right, there's your PCM or your voltage regulator. It's going to be energizing that one with this duty cycle. And you can actually go, there's a little naked screw that goes to the field on that ranger and on that uh, uh, sable out there. And you can hook a scope up to that thing and you can watch that thing switch. You can load it and see that change. You know what I mean? Yeah, so that's what, that might be a good thing you want to play with. 75% duty cycle, 25% duty cycle. It doesn't put it, the more magnetism, the more it's ground in this, uh, then the stronger the put it output's going to be of the alternator. And you'll also hear the, the engine go, you know, like if you do something and all of a sudden makes the alternator start putting out, you're here and hunker down because it's taking some energy to pull it and all that. And then I put a little a brand name on my battery, Evercrank. You've got bolts, PCM, a regulator, measures battery voltage and changes the duty cycle of the ground and it's shooting for a voltage. If you've got an overcharging battery, you may have a voltage regulator or PCM issue. I've seen one because centrifugal force one time, I've seen, I've seen one full field because of that when it started <coughs> spinning up a little motor home. And I said, well, that's got to be a voltage regulator. Well, pull the darn thing off, put a voltage regulator, put it back on. Do you think it would? Do you think it would? It would only do that. Uh, that's what folks around here say when your car ain't fixed. Did you think it would? Did you think it would? You ever heard that? You ever heard those words? And that's some. Everybody says that. That's like little kids saying, "He hit me for no reason." And they all they use the same inflection. <laughs> But anyway, uh, the rectifier is actually the uh, part of it that takes the alternating current created 
and those windings and turns it into direct current. This is a variety of different ones. They look all different ways. That's the big output post on there. All right. Now AC was created here. The rectifier do this. It actually puts everything above zero. See, this is zero. It's going above and below zero. That's what's coming out of the wall. You get, you know, hundred. Then you got sixty cycle per second. You know, hundred twenty volts through. And it actually you can make that uh, turn into direct current. Now here's your diode. Diode is like a one-way valve for electric current. It won't let it go but one way. And when you stack them in there, the way this is done, this right here is your rotor, which is spinning inside of that, which is creating that. And then one of these rectifier diodes, whenever it goes through that, there's your voltage regulator. And whenever it comes out of there, you wind up with alternate current. Now if you put a capacitor in there, you can flatten out that ripple, but there's no point in doing that typically. And Alternate currents rectified, converted to DC current by the series of diodes. Now this is something I did in the classroom with that little thing over there with a the scope that we used to have here. Uh, I could put a rectifier bridge like you could buy at Radio Shack in there, run that AC current through it, and you'd wind up with, with this. So it's taking the bottom one and turning it over so it's up here like that. You got that? It's actually taking AC and turning it into DC. All right, the once external rate alternator cooling fan. Remember seeing those? Uh, what they used to say was, if you thought the belt wasn't tight enough on your alternator, you could tell by grabbing that fan, and if you could turn that fan and slip the belt with your fingers, the belt wasn't tight enough. If you got one that you have to tighten the belt on, now they most of them have belt tensions unless they're a Nissan or something like that. But anyhow, you're basically, the in, you can't do that anymore because the fan's inside the alternator. Chrysler started doing that back in the 1960s. Alright, so some have two fans due to space limitations and higher under the temperatures. Also, that fan whirling out there like that can It'll get a knuckle too if you're really careful. Some four to six liter applications are fitted with two little but really powerful alternators now instead of a great big one uh, because of extreme demand and space limitations. Some guys install additional alternators just for fun of it. This is some of the people that you see. You look on the internet, you see where people put a whole bunch of alternators on there. You know, snake them belts around, so they got all kinds of, you know, five, six hundred amps for their boom box junk and all that. Which will get you a $275 ticket in this here town. You know what I'm saying? You're driving through op with your boom box going, and brrr, they're going to write you a ticket for that. All right. And I've seen it happen. One of my students, I kept telling him, stop doing that in op. You're going to get in trouble. He didn't listen. You got to be 200 All right. Dual alternators. And that is wired in parallel. What's parallel mean? If I'm hooking jumper cables up, how am I hooking the batteries up? Parallel. Parallel. Negative to negative, positive to positive. It's parallel. That's right. The alternator's hooked up that same way. Now, some of them, one of the alternators doesn't work until the engine's running. The other one, you know, or, or when it needs the glue plug. I mean, there's all kinds of different little reasons they do it. But for the most part, if you had a 1200 amp alternator, you know, like some of the great big, huge, I mean, $1,200, you know, alternators that have huge amounts. I've used to work on those things. At least they all have made some and all that kind of stuff. And they started putting two, two little alternators were cheaper than one big one. Uh, and the space can, you know, all that. Well, here's the necessities. Here's your bolted regulators look kind of like this. Now, right over there, you see that thing right there where I'm pointing? That's an bolted regulator like what they used to mount on the fender. And Ford had those on their Tauruses all the way up until like 1990 or 1986 or 7. And some of the pickups had them and all that kind of thing. And so basically, um, there's typically four connections on one of those alternators. a field connection. There's the R terminal connection, which is off of one leg of the stator, and that tells the uh, thing that the uh, tells it that the alternator is putting out, so it doesn't turn on the light. I, the I terminal on a charging system coming through the light, turns on the regulator. So you need to make sure that battery light is working. If that alternator is putting out, turn that key on, see if the battery light's working. If the battery light ain't working, you better find out why. And that's even on today, on a lot of today. Now most of this, most of them nowadays, the PCM is controlling the field. Chrysler started doing that in the mid '80s. You know, Chrysler had a lot of cutting edge stuff they were doing. Uh, the voltage regulator is a, gets a 12 volt turn on feed through the battery charging warning light. And see, whenever you see that light right there, and you might even notice it's got a resistor jumping around it. In case that bulb blows, and the resistor will still feed that down there and turn that regulator on. That regulator is a device that's got to be turned on. Some of the diesel engines I worked on in cranes and stuff had an oil pressure switch. So when you got a wall pressure, it would turn that regulator on. And all that. But anyway, that is another thing. Uh, now, this Chrysler started using engine control or voltage regulators a long time ago. And you notice how system voltage is regulated for drive in. Make sure you know how it's regulated. That's why on your Chrysler alternator, you got an alternator there with just two little posts, uh, you know, two little wires hooked to it and then a big wire. And if you look on the other end of the two little wires, one of them goes to the automatic shutdown relay and the other one comes from the engine controller. And that basically 
And the, the engine controller is by default looking at this. Now the engine controller on some of the Chryslers measures the temperature of the battery too. You like to take the battery out and you see a temperature sensor in the bottom of the battery tray. Battery temp sensor. That's, I don't know anybody else but Chrysler that does that. A lot of them actually have got little uh, inductive pickups around the uh, battery cable at the engine controller and, or whatever, the P BCM, whatever, is reading uh, how much current's coming out of it. That's what the Chrysler one looks like. You see this little, these little terminals right here? You got diodes here, so you got your rotor, you got your stator. See how they didn't want to draw those all that complicated, you can get an idea. And then that one right there. And this is going to be going to your starter. Now a lot of the time they'll use the big starter post for a junction. The battery will hook to that, and then they'll hook to that same one and go to the alternator. So the alternator is going to be feeding the charge current to that big post on the starter, and it's going to go straight on over to the uh, battery. So they'll use that. Sometimes, sometimes you know, they use a jumper. They use that for a junction because it's a really good junction. You can do that. And you remember that too. That's going to be on your final too. Charging system test is not really complicated. We got a big machine, a snap-on machine out here to do it with. Uh, you, you need to be able to measure amps with an inductive probe. You can get one like this for $113 at Tooltopia. Come to Leeds. Make sure you don't go to Harbor Freight and buy one of them that only measures our AC current. They're like $13. It ain't worth a darn when you're working on a car, but they're good for working on house stuff. You know, they're okay. I like to say a lot of people turn their nose up to Harbor Freight, but if I just get started, I'd hit Harbor Freight real, <laughs> really hard, you know, because you can get some pretty cool stuff over there, specialty tools too. If you're looking for about 14 and a half volts island, that's usually the target voltage for what the regulator wants. The amperage will vary with measured battery voltage. So when that voltage goes down, see if we turn the knob on our tester and we pull the battery voltage down, you see the amps go up. Because it's basically responding to that lower voltage and it will, you know, full field it. Alright, you can disable a fuel ignition system, spin a starter, or once again, above 9.6 volts is good. Now what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go to half of your cold cranking amp for 15 seconds and see if it stays above 9.6 if you're testing it, if you're doing the muscle test on the battery. You remember the test, did y'all do this one where you measure the voltage of each cell? Remember that? That's another way you can, this is Sun's battery test. Charge it up, you can measure it charging, measure it loaded both ways, and if it varies a tenth of a volt from cell to cell, then you can condemn the battery. If you put one on charge, you put a battery on charge, and you charge it on high charge for three minutes, and you look at that thing after it's been charging for three minutes, if it's going above 15.6 volts, it's sulfated battery, you need to do away with it and put another battery in there. You got that? More than 15.6 volts after three minutes. You can full field some alternators, and it's really kind of difficult to do on a lot of them nowadays. What that means is you hook the ground to that little F terminal on the back of that's a Ford alternator. On the old GM kind, they had a hole in there, and they like that on that 350 over there that he started up, but you still got to do that five more times. All right, so the test hole, you want that screwdriver, you're actually shorting out that little, see that little tab right there? When you touch the ground to that little test tab in there, it's going to full field it. Full field it telling you what it's capable of. And give it a little gas, measure it up, see if that thing will really crank out. Four to six ohms is what you ought to be reading right here. If these right here, this is a, this is a set of worn out brushes that we took off of a Dodge Caravan alternator that we had to replace. Uh, measure the rotor where the brushes ride, look for worn out brushes, which is common. If you see the winding, then the alternator all cooked and burned up and stinking, or if the alternator is going, <laughs> that's awful. You know, you're going to have to replace it anyway because it's got diode issues. Well, if you can see them burned winding, then sometimes they'll stink. You know, the diode and plate assembly is right there, and there's your diodes. Remember that. Remember that's a diode. That was one way valve for electrical current. You got three stator coils, six diodes. There's your minus, there's your plus. This is going out the battery, right? When in doubt about the health of the stator, outside the winding, now they got a thing on the machine we got that you can push it. If it's supposed to be, it lights it up red, then it's supposed to be bad, but I don't trust that. I like to put a scope on it, uh, and you can either measure the voltage or put the inductive lead on it. Now the yellow line is a perfect pattern. That's part of the wave. You'll see if everything's good. All you'll see is that part right there. See that? That's an actual trace I picked up on our Pico scope out here. And this right here, you know, good generator. This one here is a bad diode uh, or a stator. And that one right there is, you know, stator connection bad. You know, they got different little patterns here they give you on that. And that's another one we got out here when we were working on one. More alternators nowadays than ever before are using overrun and pulleys. An overrun and pulley, you've got a simple one way clutch, and an internal clutch allows the rotor and the alternator coach to a stop, and the engine shut down. And the overrun of feature eliminates chirp. Sounds happen when the belt accelerates, causing the belt to slip at the alternator pulley. Basically, it's using those, some centrifugal force too to help with you. But anyway, if these things crap out on the inside and they start to come apart, they may make a lot of noise. And you can get just that pulley. Some of them, they'd all be replaced at 60,000 miles. 
and you know, you see little springs in there. You know how many springs uh, will release one way and get tight the other way and let it go? It's like one way clutch, and that's how that works. Service life cycle is dependent on duty cycle. This one here should spin freely in one direction and immediately lock in the other. It's a little sprag clutch in there, sort of, or you know, roller clutch, I guess you call it. And note the spline, you got a special wrench, and these other ones have got to be pop that little cover off of those. If you see one, it's got a cover, pop that cover off, you see a big old 17 millimeter Allen wrench in there. Actually, and sometimes when you buy the pulley, it'll come with just like a, uh, uh, like a piece of a 17 millimeter Allen wrench. You can put a socket on it and spin it off. That's the best way you can get an alternator pulley off, so spin it off with impact. Popping the plastic cover off and reel that 17 millimeter. Magnetic field can be produced by forcing current through an insulated conductor, true or false. You know you're shaking your, your nodding your head. That's true. Four brush starter, two brush leads will be grounded, two will be insulated. That's true. Commutators, that's it, you already you made a 50 so far. Commutators are copper strips that connect each brush to loops of wire around the solenoid. These are commutator strips right here. One on this thing right here, that part right there, that's a commutator. That's an armature. All right. The overrunning clutch free wheels when the speed of the flywheel falls below that of the drive pinion. So in other words, you ever have you ever heard somebody keep the starter engaged and go, eh, and it's making that racket? That's the overrunning clutch, just raising cane in there. Uh, the, the gear ratio between the starter drive and the, is like 14 to 1. You know, 14 turns of the gear to, you know, one turn of the flywheel. It's got spin to the the only purpose of the starter mount is solenoid is to engage the starter drive. What else does it do? It engages the starter drive, but it also makes the connection between the battery and the motor, right? According to one principle of electromagnetism, the strength of the electrical field around a conductor can be increased by rapid conductor to coil, raising the voltage of current which is flowing through the conductor, placing an iron core near the conductor, or all of the above. Fender mounted starter solenoid engages drive gear with a flywheel. This is the one like we got on the Bronco right here. That does not do that. The fender mounted starter solenoid doesn't directly do that. It sends current down there and makes it happen that way. But uh, technician believes the ground's been lost on a fender mounted starter relay. They should confirm this by doing what? The relay mounting bracket. See those bolts that are bolting the fender? That's where it gets its ground on that. This right here powers up, makes a connection between those two. That goes down to the starter and fires it right on up. Now a lot of them nowadays have got a, a big old a solenoid on a fender like that, but they've got a little wire going down to a regular solenoid on the starter, a lot of these Fords do. Remember when Emmanuel put that uh, wire in the wrong place and whenever you cranked the car when the alternator was putting out, it had the starter engaged all the time. <laughs> and it burned the starter up on that expedition. Okay, uh, starter motor, solenoid shift system, the drive pitch is forced into engagement with the ring gear by what? The shift fork, that's the shift fork right there, it kicks it in right there. And then finally question 10, alternator voltage regulator is what? A, turned on by voltage that passes through a battery or charge warning light. Uh, B, the most expensive part of the charging system. C, you replace when the belt's worn out or D, never fails. A is the right answer on that one. Tell me you learned something. Yes. yes. Yeah, I mean I shoved an awful lot down your throat really quick. It's like my son going through the Navy and getting five years of nuclear physics down his throat in two years. You know, that's what they have to they, they have to make sure that you're able to perform. Are y'all gonna be able to perform? Yep. You wanna know how things are done? Yeah, I thought I was. Are you gonna be the guy that they say, Who are we gonna get to do this tough job? They're gonna say, Get him. Because when he was in school he was lazy and stood around a lot, but now that he's in the shop he works real hard. Right? <laughs>